from different parts of the world. Um, right. Well, it is often said these days, in a tone of some regret, that we face an uncertain future. If only we could be more certain. If only, knew, if only we knew what fate awaits us, then we could plan ahead, prepare ourselves, perhaps even change things to weed out aspects of the future we don't like and choose those that we do. We could subject the future to a kind of artificial selection. In pining for certainty, however, we should perhaps be careful what we wish for. After all, the one certainty we all have like is that <laughs> every one of us will eventually die. Yet, even if death inev inevitably comes to everyone, at least we die in the knowledge that generations will follow, facing their own uncertainties, just as we did. Whereas certainty augurs the dead end, uncertainty opens up the field for life to carry on. For it is a defining property of life that it continually overreaches itself. Far from running from beginning to end, every ending in life issues into new beginning. Or as an elder from the Wemenshi Cree, indigenous hunters of Northern Canada, told their ethnographer, Colin Scott, life is continuous birth. The curse of uncertainty is to present this excess as a deficit. To say that the future is uncertain is to suggest that life is not yet fully destined, that there is still work to be done to determine where it will finally lead. The word conveys a sense of incompletion, of unfinished business, of having not yet gained the full measure of the world that would yield to total predictive confidence. There are still gaps in our knowledge, missing pieces that remain to be inserted. Nowadays, we look to what we call the science to complete the picture. The science should not, of course, be confused with what practicing scientists actually do. Indeed, scientists would be among the first to protest that we can never really be, we can never be really certain about anything. Rather, the science is an institutional apparatus founded in ritual and rhetoric that confers authority and legitimacy on governments, which even with the best of intentions, though often with the worst, claim to follow it. If the science's predictions look grim, as they do today, it can propose mitigations to avoid complete catastrophe, yet it admits to no future beyond the predictive horizons of the present. And perhaps that's why today's younger generations are less inclined to see the future as a landscape extending indefinitely into the distance than as a plateau bearing down upon them. No previous generation has been so starkly presented with the prospect of the end of history, even of life itself. The future to them seems all too certain. Nor is it any relief to, uh, to be found, nor is any relief to be found in a stance of denial through regression from certainty to uncertainty. Yet what the deficit model presents as uncertainty, takes on a quite different hue in the light of excess. Then uncertainty reappears as possibility. Now for the science, radical possibility is hard to pin down. As the philosopher Henri Bertson put it, the domain of life is characterized by incommensurability between what goes before and what follows. Science, Bergson argued, is simply unable to cope with this idea of the absolute originality and unforeseeability of forms. It can work 
only on what repeats. And in the language of repetition, science can only think possibility on a scale of risk or probability. On this scale, what cannot be determined is left to chance. And indeed, the opposition between chance and determination is deeply etched into modern thought. <clears throat> it, is an, it is an opposition, however, that, that drains life of its creative impulse, reducing freedom to random variation within a phase space. What would it take then to face the future as a realm not of uncertainty, but of possibility? Young people with their lives ahead of them are often encouraged to think of the life course as a process of fulfilling their potential. That is a movement of progressive closure in which all possible paths are gradually narrowed down to the one actually taken and which itself at life's end reaches its ultimate conclusion. As the anthropologist Clifford Geertz put it in a now classic formulation, one of the most significant facts about us may finally be that we all begin with the natural equipment to live a thousand kinds of life, but end in the end having lived only one. With one's potential fulfilled, there is nowhere further to go. But what if, instead of heading towards destinations unknown, we were to push out from places already reached along a path of renewal that knows no end? Could this be what the Pintupi, an Aboriginal people of Western Australia, meant when they told their ethnographer, Fred Myers, that life, life is, a, is a one possibility thing? Now this calls for some reflection. <clears throat> for the Pintupi, the contours of life are those of the country in which they dwell, a country created by the ancestral beings as they moved around in the formative era known as the dreaming. Every existing creature as the incarnation of the ancestral power from which its vitality is derived, effectively finds itself on the inside of an eternal moment of world creation. And where the ancestors led, <coughs> life is bound to follow. But this is not a moment, a movement from A to B, from a starting point to a destination. It rather carries on. Life is a one possibility thing for the Pintupi because possibility can only ever be one. The idea that people could initially be presented with multiple possibilities, like a menu of options from which to choose, only to be narrowed down as life proceeds, would make no sense to them. For Pintupi people, as they roam their desert landscape, are not fulfilling their potential, but always and ever replenishing. And they may indeed have more power towards the end of life than at the beginning. So how can we express this difference between possibilities and possibility? That is between fulfillment and replenishment. Well, one way to do this might be to call on a distinction between doing and undergoing, which was central to the philosophy of John Dewey, especially in his essay of 1934 on art as experience. In life, as Dewey acknowledged, we do all kinds of things. We do first this, and then that, and as with this and that, there is a degree of certainty in the ends to be achieved. Yes, we do know what we are doing. Every deed is an intentional act, like shooting an arrow at a target. And yet, in everything we do, 
there is an experience we undergo. We are modified in body and mind, perhaps even transformed by the doing of it. And the question for Dewey was to figure out the relation between the two, the relation between doing and undergoing. Do we put undergoing inside doing, sandwiched between the original intention and its final consummation? Is undergoing something that happens to us inside the act? Well, if undergoing were thus contained within doing, doing, Dewey thought, there could be no continuity from one deed to the next. Life would fragment into a scatter of disconnected episodes. Blink and they're gone. What happens in reality, quite to the contrary, is that undergoing always overflows doing. To the extent that whatever you do takes into itself something of the experience of what you did before and is in turn carried over into what you do next. With every doing, as Dewey put it in a later lecture on experience and education, with every doing you are a somewhat different person. In short, undergoing lies precisely in the excess by which life overtakes the destinations thrown up in its wake. Now, I'm just going to share my screen and show a, show a diagram to illustrate what I mean. So here it is. Okay. Uh, we could describe every act of doing, as shown in this figure, as a transverse connection between an intention here and an objective here. So this intention leads to that objective. Then this intention leads to that objective. This intention leads to that objection. objective. We do one thing after another, one thing after another. One intention follows another. Each intention is realized in an objective. But life, the life of undergoing carries on in a direction orthogonal to these transverse links. And this is indicated here by this wavy line P. Here, P stands, this letter, P stands for possibility. So possibilities cut across, but life as a one possibility thing is longitudinal. It goes on through. And a life tracked along this line is continually overtaking itself. It's a life of becoming rather than being, yielding up not to objective consequences, for these of us but discards are left along the way, but to further possibility, not just for itself, but for all the other lives with which it tangles, including, as I'll show later on, its generational offspring. Now, crucially, while every transverse connection, I.O., denotes a line of intention, the longitudinal trail of possibility, P, is a line of attention. Now, there are two sides to attention, namely exposure and attunement. Now, I take the idea of attunement from the ecological approach to perception pioneered by the psychologist James Gibson. For Gibson, perception is about noticing things in our surroundings that may help or hinder in the furtherance of our own activity. In a word, it is about picking up information that specifies what things afford, and it can be learned. One can keep on learning to perceive, Gibson writes, for as long as life goes on. <clears throat> for example, in the practice of a craft, skill lies in becoming sensitized to subtle variations in the, in the material that a novice might miss. So the carpenter attends to the grain of the wood, the smith to the ductility of iron, 
The skilled practitioner's perceptual system, in Gibson's terms, becomes attuned to information of a certain sort. And this fine tuning of perception amounts, he says, to an education of attention. Yet in this, the momentum is entirely on the side of the perceiver. It is as if the things to be perceived were already there, laid out in the environment, merely awaiting the practitioner's attention. But what if everything is not already there? The world, after all, is not set in stone, but restless and fluid, bustling with life. Think of the fluxes of the weather, the ever-changing skies, the turn of the tides, the run of the river, the movements of animals and the growth of plants. Immersed in these fluxes, it is the perceiver who must wait upon the world attending to it in the sense of abiding with it and doing its bidding. Now this is attention on the side of exposure. As the philosopher of education, Jan Maschelein explains, exposure comes from the Latin ex positio, out of position, literally means to be pulled out of position. To be or to become attentive, writes Maschelein, is to expose oneself. And in this condition, one can no longer take anything for granted. The sense of understanding, of having solid ground beneath one's feet, is shaken, leaving one vulnerable and hyper alert, wide eyed in astonishment, rather than narrowly focused on a target. And for Marcheline, it is precisely in these movement, moments of exposure that education occurs. It's not so much an understanding as an undergoing that at once strips away the veneer of certainty with which we find comfort and security and opens the pure possibility. Yet, <clears throat> If there are two sides to attention, of exposure and attunement, of waiting on the world and tuning to a world in waiting, then what is the relation between the two? Surely to embark on any activity means placing one's existence on the line. The safe course will be to stay put, but no one can live with that. To live, we have to get moving to push the boat out into the, into the current of a world in formation. So all undergoing begins in exposure. But as it proceeds, skills of perception and action, born of practice and experience, begin to kick in. We can see this very well in, the most, in one of the most ubiquitous of human activities, namely walking on two feet. Every step when you walk, every step entails a moment of jeopardy. Falling forwards on one foot, you tumble into the void only to regain your balance as the other foot comes to land on the ground ahead. Here, bodily, the bodily skill of footwork comes to the rescue just before it's too late and you'd fall over. So what begins in the vulnerability of exposure ends in the mastery, mastery of attunement, providing in turn the ground from which the walker can once again sub submit to the hazard of exposure in an alternation that continues for as long as the walk goes on. Now, I believe that this alternation is fundamental to all life. Crucially, just as life is a one possibility thing, it is also unidirectional. In real life, submission leads and mastery follows, never the reverse. Where submission, 
casts off into a world in becoming, setting us loose to fall, mastery restores our grip so that we can keep on going. The first is a moment of aspiration. The second, a moment of prehension. So out in front, an aspirant anticipation feels its way forward, improvising a passage through and unfolding itself, while bringing up the rear is a prehensile, that is a grasping perception, already accustomed to the ways of the world and skilled in observing and responding to its affordances. And as submission gives way to mastery, or aspiration, the prehension, or anticipation, the perception, or exposure to attunement, there is what we could call a moment of inflection. Now I draw this idea of inflection from the writings of the philosopher Erin Manning, and for her, inflection is not a movement in itself, but a variation in the way movement moves. It comes at the point where a tentative opening matures from within what Manning calls the cleave of the event into a firm sense of direction. It marks the turn from undergoing into doing, at which the line of possibility discloses distinct and realizable possibilities. Now, I just introduced a couple of terms, um, namely aspiration and anticipation, and these call for some further explanation. Literally, to aspire is to draw breath. It is an active, animated taking in, like that. And to take in, as Dewey observes, and I quote, we must summon energy and pitch it in a responsive key. And with this summoning and pitching, aspiration calls upon the past in order to cast it forward into the future along a path of attention. So brimming with as yet undirected potential, brimming with possibility, aspiration anticipates the future, but does not predict it. Prediction, as we've seen, belongs to the logic of certainty and uncertainty. I mean, depending on the level of certainty, things may be predicted with greater or lesser confidence or judged to be more or less probable. But anticipation belongs to the register of possibility. It is the temporal overshoot of a life that always wants to run ahead of itself. According to the philosopher Jacques Derrida, to anticipate is to take the initiative, to be out in front, to take in advance, from the Latin, take capere in advance, ante, ante capere, uh, take in advance. So far from predetermining the final forms of things or fixing their ultimate destinations, anticipation opens a path and improvises a passage. It is a seeing into the future, not the projection of a future state in the present. Or in other words, it is to look where you are going, not to fix an end point. Now all life then is held in a tension between submission and mastery, aspiration and prehension, anticipation and perception, exposure and attunement. And in every case, the first leads, that is submission, aspiration, anticipation, exposure, leads, prehension, perception, uh, 
pre, sorry, mastery, prehension, perception, and attunement follows. So what leads is an aspiration that wells up in attention. And what follows is a precisely directed and skillfully executed maneuver. As a one possibility thing, moreover, this life begins nowhere and ends nowhere, but carries on for all time, for an every when that in Australian Aboriginal cosmology is identified with the dreaming. So every when is one way of translating the Aboriginal concept of, of the dreaming. Not everywhere, but every when. And yet we know that every mortal being will certainly die. So how can the infinitude of life be reconciled with the finitude of individual life cycles? How can we reconcile the fact that life goes on forever with the fact that every particular life only lasts so long? And to answer this question, I think we have to think again about generations. For there is a deeply held belief in many minds today, and above all, in minds that have been taught to follow the science, that life is lived within generations, but does not flow between them. What passes between generations, often described as a heritage or inheritance, is a legacy of information and resources which provides the capital from which successor generations can build their lives in their, their terms. The information could be genetic or cultural, the resources material or immaterial. So biologists, for example, talk about the way in which each generation lives its life in its own generation, but passes on its genes to the next. So that with the genes, the next generation can then build its life from those. Uh, anthropologists talk about cultural inheritance in the same way, that there's cultural properties that are passed down from one generation to the next as an inheritance or a heritage, but they are lived out within each generation. So there is a division between the transmission of information or resources between one generation and the next, and the realization of that information or resources, its expression, if you will, within each generation in turn. So the, 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 the one common denominate, denominator of all this information and resources is that they are available for transmission independently of their lifetime expression or achievement. That's what the concept of inheritance implies, that stuff is passed on intact independently of its subsequent realization in the course of a life. Now, it's very easy to see in this mainstream view a reflection of the idea that life is lived in the fulfillment of potential. You start with all this genetic and cultural potential and you fulfill it in living out your life in the way that this potential makes possible. But this leads, as I've shown, to a dead end. I mean, with all potential exhausted, there is no life to be continued in coming generations. Only the only things that are left are, are the discards that remain to be passed on in the form of inheritance. So each generation occupying its own slice of time seems fated to replace its predecessor and to be replaced in turn, rather like layers in a stack. And I'm just going to share my screen again. And here is another diagram. So on the left here, you just see this is, a, this is like a cross section of a stack with different layers. And you imagine each generation is placed on top of the one before. So this is this generation. Then we have a new, another generation here and another generation here and another generation here. And then pass, passing between generations, 
is the genetic or cultural inheritance that goes from one to the next, but the life is lived within each. And indeed, this kind of stratigraphic thinking is deeply seared in modern sensibilities, leading to a, a very easy equation of generational layers with, for example, layers of sedimentation in the history of the earth, uh, layers of deposition uh, in the occupation of a site the, the, for archaeological excavation, uh, layers of documents in an archive, even layers of consciousness in the human mind. I mean, modern people are always wanting to think of everything in terms of layers, layers added upon layers, whether they're talking about geology, about, uh, about biology, about history in the archive, about the mind. And this is a way of thinking that feeds quite directly into a rhetoric of extinction that wonders whether the coming generation or any after that might turn out to be the last, whether for our own or any other species. So there's a particular discourse of extinction that builds upon this kind of stratigraphic model. And it is the reason why we feel ourselves often facing a future lighted by uncertainty. So to lift the, un the curse of uncertainty and to restore a sense of possibility which I think is absolutely vital for us today. We need to imagine generations differently. That I become more and more convinced that the real source of our contemporary malaise when it comes to the future is because of the way we are thinking about generations and we need to find another way. And this other way is um, indicated on this diagram here on the right hand side where I've turned each of these generations, I've turned it on its side. So instead of being lateral, it's longitudinal. So here's, a, um, here's one generation. And then let's say here's the, its offspring generation. So here's a parent, here's a child coming off. And then that child in turn has a child. So that's that generation who has a child, that's that generation. And as you see, the generations are growing older together. And there's a, there's a period in which here, two generations are overlapping, or three generations may be overlapping. The um, father, son, grandson, uh, all alive at the, same, at the same moment, just here. So we imagine, instead of placing lives on top of one another in a stack, we imagine lives proceeding longitudinally and overlapping along the way. Now, <clears throat> We've seen that as a one possibility thing, life is lived not transversally, but longitudinally. So let's compare every particular life to one strand of an intergenerational braid or rope like this. Now the strand is only so long. So this, this person lives just just during this period here, and this one during this period here. So each strand is only so long, but the braid itself can continue indefinitely because even as old strands give out, new ones are paid in. This is part of ordinary human experience. Granny and grandpa eventually pass away, but father and son is still, and father is still around and, and mum and, uh, and then, well, they'll eventually become grandparents, but the new, new generations come along. There's always an overlap and that's where intergenerational life is happening. So in this brain, nothing is actually inherited, nor does a break in the chain of transmission herald extinction. Rather, it is in the overlap of generations that the life process is carried on. So life is not something that is separate from the transmission of generations. Living and generational transfer are part of the same process. Or as Bergson put it so vividly, just as the individual feels the swell of the past 
leaning over the present that is about to join it. So with life in general, we see each generation leaning over the generation that shall follow. It's this idea that, that this, this generation here is leaning over the next one. And that leaning over, the way in which one generation lead, leans over the next is a gesture of care, or it's even a gesture of love. And herein for Bergson lies the true mystery of life, to which we could add, herein lies its true possibility. How much are our fears of the end of history, of biodiversity loss and final extinction? How much are these fears a function of the way we have sliced up generations, setting them over and against one another, denying both the pr productivity of their collaboration and the affectivity of their care? What we need to do, I believe, is to bring them together again. And I'll finish there. It's quite a short lecture, but I hope that will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Timon Gold. Thank you for your participation for the Portuguese Society of Anthropology and, and Anthropology. Uh, it's so it's beautiful, your graphic presentation. Um, this second graphic uh, is a um, a cultural code, no, not a genetic code. We know uh, this Alice is some uh, the, the same figure. I made the first question. Uh, it is about uh, um, what is the, the the ability to be to be acquired by the new generation in education to overcome more capacity to the new possibilities of life. What is the mm -hmm the most important ability for the, the new generations and this relation between generations, attentions in education and the contribution of anthropology to this, this education? Well, there are a lot of questions there. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll first start with the contribution of anthropology, I think. One of the things that has, that has struck me recently, uh, now that, answer, uh, what, well, I think it's an important shift in anthropology that, that anthropologists are thinking more and more now about the future. 